So today, uh, the sermon is Lord of the Storm. And we're going to be turning in a couple minutes to our small passage for today. It just worked out that worked out well per what Andrew told me and everything. So we're in a little passage today, Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, which is where we are in the sequence of uh, Luke's gospel. And the typical subtitle for that passage is Jesus Calms the Storm. Okay? So uh, I want to begin by asking you this and ask you to ask yourself this question. In the storm, where is my faith? In the storm, where is my faith? John and Steve, you've been through a lot of storms. We, you know, I know, I know this in the last couple of years. Um, we all go through storms. So the question is, when I am ambushed, sometimes we know the storm's coming. Sometimes the storms ambush us. We're going to be talking about ambush today. When I am ambushed by chaos, calamities, and darkness... At that point, the reality is this. I am in a storm. You are in a storm. You get it? You're in a storm. Believers, unbelievers, all races, shapes, sizes, everybody is in various storms. You're going to be in the storm. So the reality is you're in the storm. The question, here's the question that is the huge difference maker. Is my faith in Jesus when I'm in the storm? In the storm, if you put your faith in yourself, you're probably going to be hurting pretty fast. In the storm is my faith. I know I'm in the storm, but is my faith in Jesus. Uh, The Lord of the storm. He's the Lord of the storm. That's our sermon title for today, Lord of the storm. Now, hear God's word from Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Then it came about on... One of the days, he also got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. This means the Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret, Lake Kinneret. And they set out. But as they were sailing, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. And they were taking on water and were in danger. And they came and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging of the waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and were amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this? that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. It's a quote from great missionary John Patton, 19th century missionary. I had my nearest and most intimate glimpses of the presence of my Lord in those dread moments when musket, club, or spear was being leveled at my life. This is a Scott missionary from the Presbyterian Reformed Church, a small denomination uh, in 19th century Scotland. There's a few of those churches still remaining. Most of them went over to our mission partner in the UK, the Free Church of Scotland. He was serving in the South Pacific in the second half of the 19th century, primarily to New Hebrides Islands, and specifically the islands of Tana, and then later uh, another island called Anawa. Both those islands, the populations of the islands were cannibals. Can you imagine that? In the second half of the 1800s to be serving and being sent by God to evangelize cannibalistic tribes on South Pacific islands. That was his calling. And he said, let me give this to you again. He said, I had my nearest and most intimate glimpses of the presence of my Lord in those dread moments when musket, club, or spear was being leveled at my life because he went through countless numbers of times where he was almost murdered. And by the way, almost eaten by the people that he was called to be 
ministering to, to bring the good news to. Now, you may not have to go to South Pacific Island and minister to cannibals to figure this out. Most of us, if we're inclined towards putting our faith in Jesus, grow a lot of in putting our faith in Jesus when we go through hard times, yes? When's your prayer life better? When everything's fat and happy? Or when the doctor just came back with something you didn't want to hear? When's your prayer life better? When your finances are great? Or when you're not sure you're going to be able to meet the mortgage? In general, with most people, it's the hard times. And you say, I don't want any hard times, God. And God may be sitting there saying, son, you need the hard times. <laughs> I'm ready for you to grow in faith. I'm ready for you to put your faith in my son. In uh, the close of 2013 through 2016, it was kind of interesting. I didn't, certainly, none of y'all are, I love y'all. Y'all are wonderful. Uh, I wasn't called to minister to cannibals at all, but I was called into an interesting situation. I was called, uh, you know, from a church that was kind of twice the size and twice the budget and twice the ministry kind of capacities of this church to, for whatever reason, Bob Daniels was persistent in God after a year of Bob getting on my case and Faith finally graduated from high school and going to college and it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm looking at, um, for whatever reason, God wants me to come to Mississippi State, to Starkville and to this church and my church where I was was kind of stuck, which was troubling to me, in the PCUSA, but had been in litigation and did have a restraining order and a settlement agreement with the Presbytery that protected me and protected my associate pastor and protected my youth minister from being dismissed by the Presbytery. So we had like a, a wall of protection, even though we were noted evangelicals. I was on the General Assembly Council and was noted as being the most evangelical member on the General Assembly Council of the PCUSA, and people were kind of concerned because... Uh, you know, when's he going to leave? What's he going to do? What's he going to do with the church that he's presently serving? That's kind of was my case for like 10 years before coming here. Well, when I finally agreed to the call um, to move forward with looking at the call, but I said to Bob at the time, I said, I'm not sure your presbytery, I've done a little bit of groundwork. I'm not sure your presbytery is going to like approve me to come serve in your church. And sure enough, a couple weeks after Bob let the presbytery know that I was looking at accepting the call, this presbytery adopted something that was totally non-kosher, unconstitutional, under the, even the PCUSA Book of Order. They, they adopted a resolution that was actually made by an elder in this church who's no longer here, that all the pastors, all the teaching elders, the ministers of word and sacrament in, our, in this presbytery would have to affirm as their ultimate allegiance to being in the PCUSA and keeping our churches in the PCUSA you know, along with serving Jesus and those other kind of vows. So that actually passed in our presbytery in May of 2013. And then I was on track to be examined um, in the, initially in the summer. And I told Bob Daniels at the time, I said, well, maybe God doesn't want me to come here because when they bring this up, I'm going to say I will not make that affirmation. It's just, you know, it's totally unfaithful. But interestingly, a couple of uh, attorney elders from First Greenwood at the time lodged a disciplinary procedure and the thing went to the Synod uh, Permanent Judicial Commission and so it was a case before a court basically at the church and so they didn't impose that on me. I kept waiting for the shoe to drop when I was examined by the committee and then examined and then I found out later that the guys from Greenwood had kind of stalled this thing. But you know when I arrived I, I pretty much every, every month on the month received phone calls from the man who was the executive presbyter of um, uh, the Presbytery of St. Andrew say, if you even talk about leaving the denomination, if you let your congregation talk about that, if I hear anything from your session, because we had three or four people in our session that were in constant contact with the Presbytery, um, I will, your ministry is over, I will ruin you, this Presbytery will go after you, you know, no holds barred. And remember, we didn't have any kind of protection here. I mean, it wasn't like in Hilton Head, South Carolina, where I had a protective order. So anyway, when you're in the storm, where's your faith? For whatever reason, God wanted this to happen, and God actually guided us through, as some of our folks, dear friends, have shared. So going through a storm is like a stress test. You find out where your heart really is. As we've been working our way through Luke's gospel, you, you know this, when we got to cycle two in 
in Luke chapter 8, and we spent three weeks on it leading up to this passage, Jesus has been saying, the people with the good hearts hold fast to the word, and they produce much, much fruit, right? So that, that's, what, that's what he says in Luke chapter 8, verse 15, in his explanation of the parable of the soils. But that in the good soil, the, the seed, the word of God that goes into the dust, in other words, the people were dust, through which God can bring forth real life. These are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance. Stress test, where's your heart? Is it holding fast to the word? Because let me tell you this, and young people, preteens, teenagers, you can get this if you'll hear it. Storms are going to come your way. They may already have come. With your friends, with the current generation, even more so. You know, through the roof, levels of anxiety, suicide contemplation, suicide attempts, the drama of social media, the drama of what's going on in the world. These are tough times. The storms will hit. And here's your question, when I am ambushed, because you're going to be surprised sometimes by chaos, calamities, darkness. The question is, is my faith in Jesus? So like I said, we're in cycle two, what I'm calling cycle two of Jesus' public ministry. Uh, Luke chapters eight and, and much of chapter nine until he sets his faith face toward Jerusalem to go the way of the cross. It's a whole other area of Luke's gospel we'll get into later. But remember where we are right now, Luke chapter eight, verses 1 through 21, Jesus, by his word, creates a church of believers. He's now creating a church, this group of his apostles, other disciples, the women disciples who are supporting him, who hear and do his word, hear and do his word. That's what he keeps saying. My, my mother, my sisters, my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Poeo, uh, Luke 8, 21. Now, here we are at this story. Uh, this story opens up a whole new little segment, uh, Luke 8, 22 through 56, in a new series of miracles. Jesus has already performed all kinds of miracles early as he's calling his disciples and his apostles. He's shown that he has total power over creation, total power over the demons, the, 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 the kingdom of Satan. He's shown all this. He can heal. He can raise the dead. We, we already know this. But now Jesus is going to go back through miracles, uh, equipping his developing church of believers for bold missionary faith in him, because you know what the next round is going to end up being? He's in heaven, and we're the ones who are supposed to move forward in the mission. We're not just spectators <laughs> and saying, wow, this is really impressive. He's calling us to embrace what this means, to actually believe in him like this, that he has authority over danger, demons, disease, and death, because we will face in our lives and in our mission of following him danger, demons, disease, death. So we have this new series of miracles, and Jesus is calling his church to this bold missionary faith in him as Lord with authority over the storm, over Satan and Satan's realm, over sickness and death. We're going to go through that with the rest of chapter 8. You know, he's going to deal with the storm here. Next, he's going to deal with demons and Satan's realm. And next, he's going to go to disease and death death, the woman with the flow of blood, and Jairus' daughter. This is all in chapter 8. He's going to take us through this, take his disciples through this as he equips them. He's going to show them, and he's telling us, that all natural and supernatural dangers hear and obey his word. See, make the connection. He's calling you to hear and obey his word, and he's going to show you that even the demons hear and obey his word. They have to. He's inviting us to, because we're in a different kind of relationship with him. He's inviting us and compelling us to hear and obey his words. The demons do it. The raging waters do it. We gotta get who he is, right? <laughs> All authority in heaven and on earth. I mean, so um, he calls us to hear and to do and to produce. Now. Some takeaways from today's scripture, and this is brief, but they're pretty big takeaways. 
Um, first of all, as we head into this, there are two key questions that are actually in the scripture itself. The first question is Jesus' question to his disciples, and I've already emphasized this pretty heavily. Where is your faith? That's his question. And then their question, who is this then? You know, who is this? They've already asked this question in kind of cycle one, but now they're really having to ask it because they need to deal with it because he's, he's not going to be with them for another 30, 40 years. I mean, we got about another year to go, and then it's, 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 he's gone. So let's look at what happens. Jesus says, let us go across to the other side. Now, we'll often hear the maxim, oh, the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And when most people hear that, they think, oh, I'm gonna be like on a cushion, just watching Netflix or something like that. That's what it means to be safely in God's will. That is not the truth. So let me go to point number one, and you can fill in the blanks on your sermon notes. Number one, Jesus directs his disciples, and in other words, his church, on a course heading into what? A beach vacation? Into dangers. Into dangers. And we got at least a couple big things here. Number one, foreign mission territory. Why do we need to go anywhere else, Jesus? We're perfectly comfortable here. We got enough to do here in Capernaum and, you know, in the little Jewish area of the upper Sea of Galilee. Why don't we just stay here? No, no, no. He's taking them into foreign mission territory, the Decapolis, where his mission will be to Gentiles and even, yes, Gentile demoniacs. And secondly, the surprise storm. Now, I've got a map for you. If we can put it up, I'll show you where we are. So Jesus is, he's in, see where that's green kind of Galilee? That's like Jewish Galilee, and he's in uh, Capernaum. He's going to take them over to the east of that Lake of Gennesar. That's another term for the Sea of Galilee. He's going to take them over to the east, and he's specifically heading kind of southeast down, uh, southeast down to that yellow part that's called Decapolis, but he's also going to hit into um, Galanitis and Batanea. You see the purple up above the yellow? And by the way, that purple up above the yellow, you see what up, what's up above it? Syria? Okay, right now when you hear the news reports about Hezbollah firing rockets, or Hezbollah is in that blue part that's called Syria, all the way down through and around uh, Mount Hermon. Actually, current Israel goes up to basically the foot of Mount uh, Hermon. And that Golanitis is another name for what we call the Golan. Okay? So Jesus is taking them over. He's going to end up in Golan too, but he's also going to Right there where the purple and yellow meet, there's a little thing that's hard to read called Kersey. That's where the um, demoniac is going to be ranging in. Okay? So Jesus is taking them over into Gentile territory. It's, it's like, why is he doing this? Well, he's taking them into danger. And then he directs his disciples not only into foreign territory where there's going to be crazy demoniacs who are inher inhabited by and controlled by legion of demons. I mean, who wants to go on that trip, right? On top of that, the storm comes, the surprise storm. And the Bible teaches us that storms are a blessing and that God blesses us in the midst of storms. Just get your head around that. If we're going to follow Jesus, you, you, we've got to open ourselves up to this. So and this is all through the Bible, but I'll just give you one. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It's It's great. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full course, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. So in other words, we may need to lose some of our stuff to lack nothing because God's going to bring us blessings that do not go away when we die. Okay? Uh, you can go to Romans chapter 5. It's all, it's all through the New Testament. So... This brings us, uh, oh yeah, and I do have about the wind. I think I've got, uh, I'll get to the wind in a minute. Number two, don't trust your experience. Don't trust your experience. And that's a double entendre that's got at least two meanings. Number one, don't trust the way you've always known things to be, okay? And the way you 
seeing things in your life. Don't trust that. Jesus is going to bend your understanding. And number two, don't trust your personal present experience of everything. What you think is horrible may actually be God working in your life, and he's going to bring you through this. So to fill in that blank, don't trust your experience. Instead, trust Christ. Don't trust your experience the way you've always seen things and the way you, you think things are right now. Trust Christ. And you say, well, that would actually take faith. That's not the way I do it. And the answer is yes. Exactly. Where's your faith, right? Don't trust your experience. Trust Christ. And here's the thing. Even experienced disciples will be surprised by sudden, unexpected storms. So if, if you're reading with Luke, if you're actually reading the finessed language that Luke does, he's telling us something that's going on, and it fits the story. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John, they are experienced fishermen. They know how to read the skies. Most storms that hit the Sea of Galilee, most storms come in off the Mediterranean or up south, okay? And Jesus talks about this a lot. You know how to read the red sky, and you know when a storm is coming. You may remember this, but you don't know the sign of the times. These guys know. They're experienced fishermen. These are tough dudes. They've been out on the Sea of Galilee countless times. But occasionally, a windstorm comes from the north, from that area I was showing you on the map in the north. It comes down from the north and sweeps down in a matter of minutes. And you are not prepared for it. You cannot be prepared for it. You don't read the sky on this, and this is a windstorm. This is not a rain, you know, thunderstorm. This is a windstorm. And it takes over the Sea of Galilee. And nobody, you know, who's vulnerable can survive it. So uh, just to give you a little bit on this, Gordon Franz, I was reading him last week about this. He's got this article called, What Type of Storms Did Jesus Call Wind or Rain? And, and it, what he's telling you is it's wind. It's in the Lexham Geographic Commentary on the Gospels. A guy who's not a Christian but who worked in the Sea of Galilee area, Israeli Jew, for, for decades, uh, called Mendel Noon. He has great articles on this too, exactly confirming what Luke is talking about with Jesus. So let me tell you what, what we're looking at here. That's what you're looking at. That's, that's a literal modern, when, when one of these things hits. You see that on the left? You see that boat there? And by the way, this is a minor version of the same thing. When it comes in, these folks, you see how it's just going to take over? Um, you're talking about like a, a little mini hurricane hitting out of the blue. So that's why tough guys who've been on the water a lot during, you know, rainstorms, like Simon and Andrew, James and John, are freaking out. Which brings us to number three. Dangers and desperation by God's grace lead us to Jesus as our what? Lead us to Jesus as our only Savior and Lord. You cannot save yourself from the big storms when they hit. There's no doctor. There's no counselor. There's no philosopher who can actually save you. There is one Savior, the Lord of the storm, the Lord of the storm. Master, Master, we are perishing. Simon Peter, once again, uses this epistatis term for Jesus that, you know, he used back on the, you know, when, when Jesus said, go back out in the middle of the sea and cast your nets. But this is crazy. Nobody, nobody gets fished during this time. And we, we fished all night where we're supposed to fish, and we got nothing. Nevertheless, Master, okay, I'll go if you say so. Now we get this term again, and Jesus wakes up, and he rebukes the storm. Isn't that awesome? He, he doesn't, you know, do a big dance. Notice this. Does he stop? Does he need to stop and pray to the Father in heaven? No. Jesus, as God himself on earth, the Lord of the storm directly rebukes the storm, and it's gone, quiet. I want you to know that Jesus. Which brings us to number four. Ask and confess who he is. Put your full faith and credit in him as Lord. Your full faith and your full credit in him. Hey, it's stewardship season. That's what we're talking about, right? your full faith and credit in him. The disciples, they are afraid, amazed, and asking, who then is this? 
He commands even winds and water, and they obey him. Yeah, he's God. Do you know him as your God? Do you know him as your Lord? Put your faith and credit in him as Lord of the storm, the Prince of Peace, and the King of Heaven. Because he's all of that. As missionary John Patton said, I had my nearest and most intimate glimpses of the presence of my Lord in those dread moments when musket, club, or spear was being leveled at my life. Today, tomorrow, and for all your life, give him all your heart. Put your faith in him. The storms, youth that just got back from the retreat, I, I'm, it's reality. Storms are going to hit. But you know what? When your faith is in the Lord of the storm, he will see you through. He's the boss over the storm. You trust him in that. And know him forever. That's real peace. And it was quiet. But guess what? Sorry, next week, he takes him on to the demoniac in the cave. So we'll get to that next week. It doesn't stop. We just grow with him, right? Our trust is in him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.